The topic of the lecture is uh, Paradoxes of Liberty. And I noticed that Ronnie Dworkin has already announced that he's going to talk about Paradoxes of Equality, matching that. And unfortunately, I wouldn't be present to hear that, but I might be able to find out from him in Oxford as to what it is that he wants to say on that. Liberty has many paradoxes. Jean-Jacques Rousseau discussed the possibility that members of a society can be, quote, forced to be free, unquote. John Stuart Mill examined and rejected the view that a person should be, quote, free not to be free, unquote. A remark attributed to Lenin, almost certainly apocryphal, goes something like this, quote, it is true that liberty is precious, so precious that it must be rationed, unquote. Paul Claudel, the mystic diplomat, a paradox himself, produced the following thought, quote, I'm free, deliver me from liberty, unquote. And Thomas Jefferson produced this chilling aphorism, Quote, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. Unquote. Are paradoxes useful? Some of them are rather amusing, and amusement, I suppose, is a virtue. But that is no guarantee that the paradox may be useful in any other sense. It could entertain without enlightening, divert without contributing, a bit like some of the video toys that have recently conquered the Western civilization. But I believe that many of the paradoxes involving liberty are, if anything, more useful than amusing. In fact, some of them are far from, far from being entertaining, send a shiver down one's spine, and this seems to be to be true of some of the quotations with which I started. On the other hand, in drawing our attention to some fundamental conflict, some deep tension somewhere, these paradoxes can and do serve useful purposes. And in this lecture, I fear I'm going to be a killjoy and discuss some paradoxes involving liberty with a frankly didactic motivation. If, like Queen Victoria, you say that you are not amused, I will say, no, indeed not. That's the general idea. A number of paradoxes involving liberty have been recently presented in a relatively new field of study called social choice theory, a field, I hasten to add, that many universities still believe does not exist. It is an offspring, on the one hand, of welfare economics, dealing with judgments on what should be done in economic matters, and on the other, of the mathematical theory of politics. The latter subject has produced many paradoxes in the past, right from its origin 200 years ago, in a famous paper by the French mathematician Borda, published in 1781. These voting paradoxes have been much discussed, including by Lewis Carroll, the creator of Alice, uh, Alice of the Wonderland, that is. The Big Bang this, that started the subject off was an impossibility theorem proved by Kenneth Arrow, showing the inconsistency of a few innocuous looking conditions relating social judgments to individual preferences. This did not involve liberty as such, except in the form of a condition of non-dictatorship. And the absence of a dictator is, of course, a terribly tiny claim in favor of liberty. In fact, one of the issues of continuing interest is the characterization of liberty in social and political theory in general, and specifically in the formal discipline of social choice theory. Perhaps I can do worse than begin with distinguishing between three alternative ways of viewing individual liberty. 
In fact, two and a half different ways, really, as I will explain. One is to see it in terms of individuals having some power over the conduct of their personal lives. And in the judgment of the relative merits of states of affairs, that vary only in terms of their personal lives, other things given, in those judgments that individuals in question should have necessary power. The definition of such a quote-unquote personal sphere is of course problematic. Some particular choice is in an individual's personal sphere if and only if it affects the way he or she lives but not directly others. And if others are affected at all, they are affected only because of their attitudes towards the personal lives of those who are directly affected. For example, my refusal to pray concerns only me directly. And that decision belongs to my personal sphere, even though you may be revolted by my immorality or be driven to hair-tearing frustration by my stupid failure to invest in the future. In the power view, individual liberty is seen, seen in terms of the power of the individual to influence judgments or decision in his own personal sphere. A second approach is concerned with control rather than power in general. In this view, my liberty consists in my having control over certain personal decisions. There is a difference between power and control. I could be powerful without exercising the control myself. And similarly, I could be given the control and I could still muff it truly and properly. The difference will in fact turn out to be of a good, good deal of interest when discussing the implications of liberty. The third approach builds on the notion of constraints. My liberty on this view demands that others be constrained from messing up my control. If I do not have control over some aspect of my personal life because of some internal reason, or even an external one that does not include others stopping me, then on this view, my liberty is not violated, though some other virtue might be. Liberty in this third characterization is concerned with constraints imposed on others, shooing them away from my levers of control. The constraint view is really an offshoot of the control view. Hence my earlier counting of it as only half an additional view. It too concentrates on control. But rather than seeing what control altogether I have, it looks at whether my controls have been cut down by others. This is sometimes called negative freedom. Freedom from interference. As opposed to positive freedom. Freedom to do things. In this, lecture, in this lecture, I shall be mainly concerned with the power view and the control view of liberty, and not directly with the constraint view. But since the constraint perspective is a variant of the control approach, a good deal of what I say about the control view will apply to the constraint view also. This includes some arguments I shall present later indicating the fundamental inadequacy of the control view. They are equally applicable, in my judgment, to the constraint view. What I shall not, however, concentrate on are some special limitations that apply to the constraint view. They have been much discussed, so much so that even I have discussed them elsewhere. It has been, for example, remarked by John Williamson, an economist, that the constraint view pushes us towards maintaining that, I quote, Robinson Crusoe, despite his confinement to a small island and the rather limited range of possibilities open to him as a result, 
was the freest of men who ever lived, unquote. This is because no one stopped him from doing anything. Certainly the constraint view takes a very narrow approach to liberty. But in this lecture, I shall not scrutinize this particular question. I have, as I said, discussed it elsewhere, and I have other things to talk about tonight. I should, however, remark that in my view, the perspective provided by the constraint approach is deeply undermined by the nature of interdependencies that apply in any society, ancient or modern. If I have not got enough food to eat because you people have snatched it away from me, then it is taken to be a violation of my liberty. But if you people take away my food by bidding it away in the market and raising its price above what I can afford, then this is not taken as a violation of my liberty. But is that dividing line really all that significant? This particular example, I have to confess, is rather colored by my recent study of famines across the world, because I did find that many of the major famines in this century, killing millions, were not related to any decline in food availability at all but to the competition for food among different groups in the society. People fight through the market and the devil takes the hindmost. Be that as it may, in this lecture I shall not concentrate on the special features of the constrained view, but its general feature of being concerned with control rather than power will come in for scrutiny. More on that later. In social choice theory, the view of liberty that is taken is a variant of the power interpretation. Consider the choice over a pair of states of affairs differing from each other in some feature that may taken to be personal to me. For example, everything else the same in one case, call it X, I wear a blue shirt and in the other, call it Y, I wear a green shirt. One way of characterizing the requirement of liberty in cases of this kind is to give me the power to determine the relative evaluation of or the choice between X and Y. If I prefer a blue shirt to green, then state X is ranked about state Y, ranked above state Y. This way of viewing liberty however, produce an immediate paradox. This paradox, which was identified by Alan Gibbard, a philosopher, in a paper published in 1974, builds on the possibility that what I prefer in my personal sphere may, however, be determined by my interest in others. Suppose I, the conformist, want to wear a shirt of the same color as you are wearing, while you, the well-known individualist, want to wear a shirt of a different color from mine. So if I wear blue, you prefer green, but then I prefer green too, when you prefer blue, which takes me to blue also and you to green again, and so on. Both our liberties in this characterization cannot be simultaneously fulfilled. This kind of problem, which is formalized in the Gibbard paradox, can be avoided in several different ways. One of them is to make each person's rights conditional on their preferences over their personal sphere being inward looking rather than outward looking. If I try to match your shirt color, then this modified condition of liberty gives me no power to determine the outcome. If, however, I prefer one color, say blue, in any case, no matter what you and others of your sort wear, then this conditional liberty does give me the power to determine that the outcome chosen will involve my wearing a blue shirt. The Gibbard paradox is a neat pointer to one difficulty in characterizing liberty in terms of power, and it has 
an equally neat resolution. The rationale of giving me the power to determine things in my personal sphere is that these decisions, such as what I wear, what I read, etc., are essentially self-regarding. But if what I am trying to do is to produce a mirror image of you, then this isn't really a self-regarding decision. And this is no longer in the field in which personal liberty should give me absolute power. I turn now to a different paradox involving liberty in social choice theory. It is one I call the impossibility of the Paratian liberal when I presented it in 1970, though I now think that the term liberal is not terribly well chosen, given the ambiguity in its meaning, especially in North American ambiguity. The conflict is in fact one, be one between a minimal requirement of individual liberty in terms of power and the so-called Pareto principle, much used in economics and other social sciences. The Pareto principle demands that if everyone, without exception, prefers some state of affairs A to another B, then A must be socially ranked above B. This respect for unanimous preference is widely regarded as an essential condition for rational social decisions. The condition of minimal liberty is defined in terms of giving at least two persons, possibly more, but at least two, the power to be decisive over some personal sphere each, no matter how tiny that sphere. The impossibility of the Paratian liberal is a theorem showing the impossibility of combining the Pareto principle with the condition of minimal liberty in producing a consistent ranking of states of affairs for any given set of individual preferences. Obviously, I shan't bother with the proof here, but I shall give a couple of examples, both of which have been discussed before. One, often called the Lady Chatterley case, somewhat unfairly to the distinguished lady in question, involves a book, namely Lady Chatterley's Lover, and two persons called respectively Prude and Lude. Prude regards the book to be typical pornography. I have to confess that the example dates the time when I was first working on this question, namely the 60s, shortly after the famous trial. And Prude regards the best state of affairs to be one in which neither he nor Lude reads the book. But if one of them had to read the book, Prude prefers reading the book himself rather than letting that pervert Lude read the book and have his revolting pleasures. Lude, on the other hand, prefers least the case in which nobody reads the book, a real waste of good literature. <laughs> but while he would love to read the book himself, he would prefer even more to have that pompous prude read the book. <laughs> now, their preferences are actually outlined, if I've got it right there. Uh, o is nobody reading it, P is the prude reading it, L is the lewd reading it, so that's the food preference going downward, and lewds is that, P-L-O. Consider now the condition of minimal liberty. The choice of prude reading the book and no one reading it may be seen to be in the personal sphere of prude himself. That is the choice between P and O. Since it's in the personal sphere of prude, it should, the minimal liberty should give him the power that he should, uh, the, the, the power that is incorporated in minimal liberty, it's plausible to think, should give him uh, a decisive say on the choice between O and P. This choice, notice, does not directly involve Lude, since he's not going to read the book in either case. Now, since Prude 
doesn't prefer to read the book. That's his preference. That bit is the one to look at. Since Prude prefers not to read the book, this indicates that nobody reading the book must be ranked about Prude, above Prude's reading it. So in terms of the social preference ordering, nobody reading the book is ranked above Prude reading the book. Similarly, if the choice is between nobody reading the book and Lewis reading it, it is a decision in which Prude is not directly involved, he is not reading the book in either case, and Lewis should have the power over that choice. Since he prefers to read the book, Lewis reading the book must be ranked above nobody reading the book on grounds of liberty. <laughs> But the Pareto Principle says that Prude's reading the book is to be ranked above Lude's reading it, since both prefer that. Therefore, we have a cycle. L better than O better than P better than L. Lude's reading it is better than nobody reading it. And, sorry, therefore we have a cycle of social judgment. Nobody reading the book is better than Prude's reading it. Lude's reading it is better than nobody reading it. And Prude's reading it is better than Lude's reading it. There is thus an inconsistency of a most elementary kind. Let us take another example. The so-called work choice case. Tom and Jerry both prefer having a full-time job to a half-time job. And that to being unemployed given the job situation of the other. But spoiled as they are by the competitive society in which they live, each prefers that the other should be jobless. Indeed, each is green-eyed enough to get more satisfaction out of the joblessness of the other than from his own job. Given the nature of the jobs involved, it so happens that there are exactly four possibilities open to the two. Namely, either one has a half-time job and the other nothing, or one has a full-time job and the other a half-time one. The preferences of the two, as described already, are given in descending order in this table, which I must get there now. The first number is Tom's employment, and the second number is Jerry's. Consider first the choice between one half and zero half, that is, Tom working full time, Jerry half time, or Tom working not at all, and Jerry half time. Jerry works half time in either case. In both cases, Jerry works half time, and the choice can be seen to be in Tom's personal sphere. Tom prefers to work. On exactly similar grounds, sorry, so I ought to say that one half should be therefore, they should be ranked in this order, one half being placed above zero half. On exactly similar grounds, since Jerry too prefers to work, work half one is placed above half O. Jerry works full time here, not at all here, and Tom either case works half, so he's not directly involved. And since Jerry would like to be employed, clearly half one on libertarian grounds is preferred to half O. But both prefer O half to half one, O half to half one, common, and both also prefer half O to one half. And that produces a hefty cycle. So we have on Paratian grounds, O half is better than half one, and half O better than one half, and on libertarian grounds already, one half is better than O half, and half one is better than one half O, and that produces an altogether a cycle. So the view of liberty as power, to as a power to determine social ranking, contradicts the Pareto principle, demanding that unanimous preferences be reflected in social ranking. 
In one way of looking at it is that if the individuals, if the Tom is allowed to exercise his rights, you'll end up here, and that is Pareto inferior. If Jerry is allowed to exercise his rights, he'll end up here, and that's Pareto inferior. And both the Pareto superior positions, this and that, are dominated by each individual uh, preferring to do something more, more of his own work, given the work of the other lying in his own personal sphere. To put it another way, if individual liberty is interpreted as giving people power in this minimal form, then individual liberty can be satisfied in situations in this kind only by choosing a state that happens to be Pareto inefficient, which means, to translate the technical term again, that the chosen state will happen to be one that is dispreferred by everyone to some other feasible state. Actually, the impossibility of the Paratian liberal can be given one of several interpretations, depending on how the power in question is to be defined. One interpretation is concerned with social evaluation, judging alternatives from a social point of view, rather than choice as such. Though, of course, such evaluation can be seen to have implications for choice also. The impossibility theorem asserts in this case, that is, with this interpretation, that there is no consistent way of making such an evaluation satisfying these conditions. An alternative is to view it in terms of normative choice directly, interpreting state X being socially ranked above Y as nothing other than the requirement that Y should not be chosen by a good decision mechanism when X is available. No matter how the social decision procedures are to be organized, for example, whether the decision between X and Y is to be given over to some individual to choose or not, it is required that they satisfy these two conditions. The normative choice impossibility which is, of course, the same mathematical theorem, but differently interpreted, says that no decision procedure exists that can fulfill these conditions interpreted in terms of what can or cannot be chosen. Within each of these interpretations, there are several possible sub-cases. For example, the social evaluation of outcomes may reflect one particular person's moral judgment. For example, what he or she thinks about the relative goodness of the states. Or alternatively, it could be the result of applying some agreed method of evaluation. For example, some cost-benefit analysis satisfying these conditions. Similarly, the normative choice interpretation can either reflect a particular person's judgment as to how choices in the society should be organized or indicate the features of some agreed decision procedure. There are many different ways of translating the result into the usual preoccupations of political and social philosophy. And that multiplicity of interpretations is one of the general characteristics of results in social choice theory. The impossibility result identifies a basic conflict, calling for a reasoned choice of priorities. Various methods of deciding on priorities have been suggested in the social choice literature. I haven't got the time tonight to discuss these different methods or assess their relative merits. Instead, I turn now to the control view of liberty. Can the problem be avoided by changing the view of liberty, shifting it from power to control? This has been suggested, and the argument needs to be scrutinized. Robert Nozick, a Harvard philosopher, put the argument very clearly in his Anarchy, State and Utopia. I quote, it's a long quotation. 
a more appropriate view of liberty, more appropriate than mine, he's criticizing here my, my formulation and the social choice formulation in general, a more appropriate view of individual rights is as follows. Individual rights are co-possible. Each person may exercise his rights as he chooses. The exercise of these rights fixes some features of the world. Within the constraints of these fixed features, a choice may be made by a social choice mechanism based upon a social ordering, if there are any choices left to make. Rights do not determine a social ordering, like here, which I'm trying to do. But instead set the constraints within which a social choice is to be made by excluding certain alternatives, fixing others, and so on. If entitlements to holdings are rights to dispose of them, then social choice must take place within the constraints of how people choose to exercise these rights. If any patterning is legitimate, it falls within the domain of social choice and hence is constrained by people's rights. How else can one cope with sense result?" Unquote. This is undoubtedly an attractive way, in my judgment, of resolving the paradox. The Pareto principle is used to rank the alternative states of affairs, and the condition of liberty is not used for that purpose. On the other hand, liberty provides the basis for giving individuals control over certain decisions, and they can exercise the control as they like, without being restrained by any social ranking of states derived from any principle whatever, Paratian or otherwise. I shall presently dispute the adequacy of the controlled view of liberty, but for the moment I accept it and ask, to what extent is this a resolution of the impossibility of the Paratian liberal? This controlled baseline of reasoning has been followed by a number of other authors as well, but it is important to distinguish between two different claims about the resolution. I shall call them the strong claim and the weak claim, respectively. The strong claim put forward by such authors as James Buchanan and Brian Barry says that if liberty is seen this way in terms of control, then there is no conflict between individual liberty and satisfying the Pareto principle. Why so? Because, it is argued, the individuals involved will jointly, will choose jointly to carry through the Pareto improvement, since everyone, by definition, prefers such an outcome, and the result of individual control will be thus one in which the Pareto condition is also satisfied. For example, in the Lady Chatterley case, individually, of course, Lude will choose to read the book, and Prude will not. But Prude and Lude will jointly move away from that, from that situation, through a contract, and end up in Prude's reading the book alone. Since each prefers this to Lude's reading the book, they will have an exchange with Prude promising to read the book in return for lewd promising not to. <laughs> is this strong claim correct? I believe it is not correct. But what is certainly correct is that such a possibility of Pareto improving contract exists whenever the outcome is Pareto inefficient. Indeed, that is a tautology, since that is a part of the definition of Pareto inefficiency. What is also true, and involves more than a purely definitional argument, is that the outcome chosen individually on their own, for example, Lude's reading the book in the Lady Chatterley case, might be one of disequilibrium, if the individuals are in a position to have an agreement, making the prude, in this case, read the book, and Lude desist from it. In fact, this possibility was explicitly pointed out by me at the time of presenting the paradox. 
But while this destabilizes the outcome with Lude's reading the book, it does not make the result of the possible agreement, namely Prude's reading the book, a stable one at all. Suppose the agreement goes through. Prude now finds himself reading a book he hates, and there is every incentive for him to break the agreement on the sly. Also, Lude finds himself kept away from reading a book he would love to read, and he too has every incentive to make, break the contract. So the agreed Paratian contract is itself a disequilibrium outcome, just like the individually chosen outcome. There is, as, a, as it happens, no equilibrium outcome in this game. Every outcome is beaten by either individual action or by joint collusive action. And that indeed is one interpretation of the paradox seen in terms of control. So the contract-based outcome on which Buchanan, Barry and others rely is not so much a solution of the impossibility problem. It is in fact a part of the problem itself. Those who are familiar with game theory will note that this instability in the Lady Chatterley case is similar to the conflict faced in the so-called prisoner's dilemma. I don't wish to go into the game theory, that game theoretic analogy. That will require too much ground clearing. But I should just note that in other examples of the impossibility of the Paratian liberal, the structure of the game can be quite different. But in all these cases, whether or not they conform to the prisoner's dilemma, there is the common characteristic of every outcome being destabilized by either individual action or by joint action under the control given by the interpretation of liberty chosen under this approach. It is, of course, possible that such a cycle will be broken somewhere. One way of doing this is through powerful enforcement of the contracted outcome. This raises deep moral questions as to whether it is right to have enforcement in an area of such private concern. Will it be right for a policeman or some other enforcer to come and make sure that Prude is reading Lady Chatterley's Lover every evening? I hear the gentle policeman saying, quote, doing my usual rounds, Governor, and just dropped in to check that your eyes haven't deserted the good book, sir." Unquote. John Stuart Mill's strictures about people not having the freedom to sell their freedom, I quoted this earlier, is possibly relevant here. But even aside from the moral question related to such contract, and more importantly, to the enforcement of such contracts, there is the pragmatic question as whether such contracts can in fact be practically enforced. Can it be made sure that Prude is in fact reading the book and not just pretending to? I hear the gentle policeman again. What was the last line you read? Tell me, sir. <laughs> They're also rather far-reaching and in my view chilling implications of trying to enforce contracts of this kind involving the conduct of personal life. One can't help remarking that those who see in such contracts a method of ensuring the full exercise of liberty as control must have missed something about the nature of liberty. But what about the possibility that enforcement may not be needed if people voluntarily stick to the contract by choosing to act against their own preference. What if Lud does not yield to the temptation of reading the book and Prude him, holds himself back from the delectable pleasures of not reading the book? The contract may be then kept without there being enforcement. But once it is accepted that individuals might act against their own preferences, then the question is raised as to whether they would have in the first place agreed to have such a contract just because it served their preference. Indeed, one can argue 
that the status of one's own preference is much more secure in choices over one's own personal sphere than the status of it in choices involving other people's personal sphere. ...to leading the life that one would like to lead rather than to securing maximum preference satisfaction, no matter whether the preference deals with one's own private life or that of another person's private life, then it is quite natural for the person to refuse to have the proposed contract. My point isn't that a Paratian contract of this kind will never be sought or negotiated, nor that, if negotiated, it will never be say, stable through enforcement or moral commitment. It is quite possible that in some particular case, all this is exactly what will happen. But such a deeply contingent occurrence, dependent on the variety of issues discussed here, can scarcely count as a general solution of the impossibility of the Paratian liberal. Since the impossibility result is concerned with the existence of a conflict between the Pareto principle and minimal liberty, whether interpreted in terms of power or in terms of control, and not with its omnipresence, that is, it's an existential theorem rather than its being universal, it being omnipresent, it remains quite unaffected by any demonstration that sometime there will be such a contract and it will be stable, while on other occasions there will be no contract or it will not be stable. It will still remain true to say that guaranteeing minimal liberty, even with liberty interpreted in terms of control rather than power, cannot be combined with guaranteeing Pareto efficiency. The strong claim, then, is simply wrong. I turn now to the weak claim. Indeed, Robert Nozick, who had initiated the criticism of the formulation of liberty in social choice theory and had provided an elegant and reasoned statement of the view of liberty as control, did not, unlike Buchanan, Barry and others, make the strong claim at all. He had accepted that it is quite possible that the outcome of the libertarian system with individual control will be Pareto inefficient. But in his view, there is no tension here, since the exercise of rights has priority over any social evaluation of outcomes, including the Pareto ranking. And if the outcome produced by the right system is Pareto inefficient, so be it. The weak claim, therefore, is not that there is no conflict between the Pareto principle and liberty, but that liberty has priority anyway. Also, since the view of liberty as control specifies a procedure rather than a ranking of outcomes, it operates on a different plane from any principle like the Pareto principle, which is just one method of ranking outcomes. I turn now to an examination of the control view of liberty itself. First, a case that helps to bring out its rationale, especially contrasted with various attempts to identify liberty with the cause of individual welfare, which Nozick, in my judgment, rightly criticizes. Ed has been injured in a car accident, but he is fully conscious and we hear him talking with the doctor. The doctor tells Ed that she can treat Ed in one of two different ways. Here I omit the gory medical details and call them treatments A and B, respectively. The doctor says that both methods would be effective, but that in terms of side effects, treatment A would be a good deal better for Ed. Ed replies that he understands the options and accepts that A would indeed serve his welfare better. But, says Ed, he has some moral objection to treatment A. Its development is associated with experiments involving much cruelty to animals. And therefore, he will in fact choose treatment B. To remember which is which, let me note that treatment A, A for animals, involves cruelty to animals. 
Whatever the doctor might think of the overall merit of Ed's decision, it seems to me that she must accept that Ed's liberty demands that he be given treatment B rather than treatment A, despite the fact that A, everyone agrees, is better for Ed's welfare. So far, so good for the controlled view of liberty. Now consider the case in which Ed has a similar accident. The doctor makes the same assessment about treatments A and B, and Ed has the same moral beliefs and convictions. Except that, in this case, Ed has become unconscious after the accident. However, Ed's companion knows Ed extremely well and reports to the doctor about Ed's moral beliefs and the strength of his convictions, adding that she knows that Ed would choose, if he were conscious, treatment B, despite accepting that treatment A would, would serve his welfare better. The doctor says, I intend to give Ed treatment A, since it is better for his welfare. But what about his own wishes, asks Ed's companion. Isn't Ed's liberty to have the treatment that he would like involved in this decision? No, says the doctor, who now reveals that she takes the control view of liberty. Ed has no control over the decision anyway. He is unconscious, and therefore his liberty is simply not involved in this choice. If you doubt the wisdom of that remark, I suggest you doubt the wisdom of the control view of liberty itself. Ed may not have any control over the decision being now taken, but if it were accepted that the knowledge as to what he would have chosen is relevant to the decision, then he could have some power over that decision. It seems reasonable to argue that in this case too, Ed's liberty would be better served by the doctor giving him treatment B, if it is clear that's what he would have chosen, even though Ed himself is not exercising the control in this case. The power view of liberty permits such an interpretation, and in this it goes well beyond the control view. It is, of course, tempting to think that what is involved in the choice of treatment B is simply Ed's welfare, especially since there is a well-established tradition in economics and also in the other social sciences identifying welfare with choice. But the example is so specified that the interpretation, that interpretation is not easy to sustain, since neither Ed nor his companion nor the doctor can be taken at all to assume that B, treatment B, would serve Ed's welfare better. Quite the contrary. The argument for treatment B rather than A, A for animal, is precisely that Ed would have chosen it, and he should be free to choose between treatments A and B. And that is clearly a liberty type consideration, rather than a welfare type consideration. What Isaiah Berlin calls, I quote, the extent of a man's or a people's li liberty to choose to live as they desire, unquote, does require, I would suggest, counterfactual exercises of this kind. To see liberty exclusively in terms of who is exercising control is quite inadequate. The concept of liberty involving such counterfactual reasoning, asking what he would have chosen, I shall call indirect liberty, and it's a part of the interpretation of liberty as power. The relevance of indirect liberty seems quite substantial in modern society. Police action in preventing crime in the streets may serve my liberty well, since I would not have chosen to be mugged or roughed up. But the control here is not exercised by me, but by the police. The fact that it may also serve my welfare better is, of course, a different consideration altogether. What is relevant for my indirect liberty in this case is the understanding that if I had control over the crime specifically directed against me, I would have exercised my choice to stop it. Of course, it is conceivable 
that a person would have chosen to be mugged or roughed up or hit by a car going the wrong way on a one-way street. But the presumption on which the consideration of liberty here is based is that he would not have so chosen. There is a danger that in crudely identifying liberty with control, overlooking the counterfactual considerations involved in indirect liberty, a lot that is important might be lost. Society cannot typically be organized in such a way that each person himself commands all the levers of control over his personal life. Liberty as power, being a broader notion, can capture this in a way that the narrower concept of liberty exclusively in terms of control cannot. If we take the power view of liberty, we can rank the outcomes or states of affairs in terms of what the person involved would have chosen. And that is, of course, the way in social choice theory liberty is characterized, and I've tried to argue, therefore, that it has, it is, that characterization is not without merit. I should also mention here in passing that incorporating liberty in the judgments of states of affairs also has the advantage of being able to take a more informed view of liberty than the procedural control view, blind to the outcomes, can permit. Take the following example. This day, last week, I spent the day at home. I could, of course, have done a number of other things, including, say, calling on the village boar, conducting a census of the village cattle, and taking a dip in the village sewers. I chose not to do any of these other things, and I think that was an excellent choice. Suppose now I had been prevented by some village bully from exercising, my, exercising any choice. In case one, we assume that he asked me to stay at home and gave me no option. In case two, he forced me to take, take a dip in the village sewers. My liberty would have been affected in both cases. That is not in dispute. But is it right to say that they would be equally violated in both cases? I think not. While both would involve a violation of my liberty, the violation is clearly larger in case two, when I would be forced to take a dip in the village sewers, than in case one, when I would be forced to stay at home, which as it happens, I would have chosen to do anyway. While there is a loss of liberty in either case, it is absurd to claim that there is equal violation in both cases. There is no difficulty in reflecting such differences in the characterization of liberty under the power interpretation. My power has to be judged in the light of what I want to happen, and the evaluation of outcomes is a part of that judgment. With the control view, however, such discrimination is difficult. Either I controlled the decision, or I did not. If I did not control the decision, then that's it. I had no liberty. In the control view, the loss of liberty is rather like the loss of virginity. All that matters is whether something took place or not. It does not matter exactly what happened. But the idea of liberty is more complex than that. It does matter precisely what happened. Liberty is not just an all-or-nothing judgment. Time to take stock. The impossibility of the Paratian liberal was detected with the power view of liberty, though under that view itself there were several alternative interpretations of the conflict. One proposed way of avoiding the conflict is by dropping the power view and replacing it by the control view. The strong claim under this approach is that the Pareto improving contract resolves the conflict. This claim we found to be just false. The weak claim is more interesting. It says that it does not matter whether the outcome is Pareto efficient or not. Liberty, it is said, does not depend on states of affairs that happen to emerge only on whether the procedure has been right. This resolution is inadequate for two principal reasons. First, insofar as the impossibility of the Paratian liberal points to an absence of equilibrium, 
some difficulty remains. Parceling, parceling out individual controls plus the right of contracts may involve us in cycles or instabilities. This has to be broken by some explicit choice of priorities. But if it is a question of choosing priorities, we are back where we started. The power view pointed in that direction anyway. And that indeed, I believe, is the right first step under either view. Like so many other conflicts in life, the conflict embodied in the impossibility of the Paratian liberal has to be faced and priorities have to be systematically applied. Even the Pareto principle requiring adherence to unanimous preference rankings has to face this battle for priorities and will often lose. This is ultimately the main lesson from the impossibility of the Paratian liberal. Second, the control view of liberty neglects what we have called indirect liberty. In a world full of interdependencies, indirect liberty may be a very important part of what we understand as freedom. Also the control view, in shunning the assessment of outcomes and states of affairs, gets caught in the trap of all or nothing formulations. I have argued that that's just not good enough for liberty. The control view also gives us a terribly inadequate framework for judging how best to exercise the eternal vigilance that we have been told is the price of liberty. Consider one last example. You hear that some thugs are about to bash up a couple, causing them great, grave physical and mental injury. The police can't be made to believe the threat and won't do anything. You know that you can, in fact, stop the bashing by arriving at the spot in time. But you can't de get there in time, since you haven't got a car, and your neighbor David refuses to lend his car, since, as he puts it, he wouldn't his like his car to be mixed up in such rough affairs. You can, however, temporarily steal his car, do the job of saving the couple, and then return the car to the genteel David. Should you do it? The control view of liberty would suggest that you must not. You would be depriving David of his liberty in the shape of the control of the use of his car, which is after all his property. In the all or nothing framework, you can't trade off one liberty against another. But suppose we could trade off liberties. Would the control view of liberty then permit you to interfere in this case? In fact, it will not, because the control view of liberty need not acknowledge that you can give the couple liberty. You can, of course, stop the bashing or not stop it. But you can't hand over the control of the choice to the couple themselves. You know, of course, that the couple would not have chosen to be bashed. And under the approach of indirect liberty, that is ground enough for you to count the anti-bashing action as safeguarding the couple's liberty. But not so under the control view. You can produce a better outcome, one that is closer to what the couple would prefer or want. But you can't rearrange the procedure in a way that the couple controls their own destiny, so far as this particular episode is concerned. In terms of the control view of liberty, if you steal David's car and save the couple, you violate David's liberty without giving the couple any more liberty. Better then forget the whole thing. If one nevertheless thinks that the cause of liberty might be better served by violating David's minor liberty, vis-à-vis -vis the control of his car, to save the couple from a major violation of their indirect liberty involving their preference not to be violated in terms of their mental and physical integrity, one has to reject the control view of liberty. One has to then see liberty as a broad value which includes indirect liberty and which is sensitive to procedures, but not just to procedures. What is needed is a more interdependent view of liberty. One has to reject the attempt to parcel out liberty 
into bits and pieces of self-contained controls. Liberty isn't like that. Um, I think there is a problem in, in, that, uh, in that way of looking at the problem. Um, you say, quite rightly, that the Pareto principle is based on individual preference, but so is the way I've characterized liberty. So does liberty. The way I've characterized liberty, and of course I discussed various criticism of that and whether these criticisms stand or not, that it's described in terms of the correspondence of the individual preference over their personal spheres, correspondence of that to social preference interpreted either in terms of judgment or in terms of choice. So that the tension, insofar as it arises, arises within the combination of individual preferences, but because both the Pareto principle and the individual liberty exercise are related to individual preferences. So it's not the case that it's arising simply because one is based on individual preference and the other is not. That's not the way it's characterized. But you raised, I think, a more interesting question when you said, is it not the case that if people are concerned about liberty, that their preferences should, in fact, also reflect um, that concern for liberty? I think there's no question that people, if they're deeply involved in liberty, their preferences will be influenced by um, their concept of liberty, their concern for liberty. But it seems to me to be a much stronger claim to say that that influence will be the dominant one in their preferences. In fact, there may be no reason for that. Take the case of a prude who happens to be a libertarian. Now, there's no inconsistency in the prude saying, I do think this is a revolting book. I much prefer you shouldn't read it. On the other hand, it's your decision. So, for God's sake, ignore my preference and go ahead and read it. So what you are getting there 
is a break between the prude's preference and what he recommends as the right moral decision. And that problem is being explicitly faced, in this case, in a libertarian manner. But the prude is not obliged, just because he's a libertarian, to actually prefer that the lewd reads this book, because he would much rather that he didn't. But it seems to me that it's a part of Prude's liberty also to have his freedom of opinion as to what lewd should do. The question of liberty, and I think there's a lot of um, rather confusing writing on this, the, the importance of liberty seems to me rests in not in what preferences I have, but what preferences I want to count, what preferences I want to press in a decision. And a libertarian wouldn't press for his preference to count in someone else's personal sphere. But it doesn't mean that he shouldn't have those preferences. So I couldn't hear the first sentence. Yes. Yes. By altering my role in it as a person who has to make the decision to steal a car. Yes. Let's say that I come into this particular relationship because I'm a psychiatrist. And they come to me for sexual counseling to make a kind of fun. The couple does. Yes. But not from each other, but from some third party. Ah, okay. Yeah. In my judgment, they would find that resolution and therefore be happy. It would be their choice if they understood the consequences. Yes. To have been met and learn their case. Yes. Right. Right. Quite right. However, if I let it go ahead, there's a role being created in the one. That is, they don't have to do. Now, you said I don't have to see the in that one. But, nonetheless, that problem of control is what I would be protecting the intervening. Well, yes. Yes and no, actually. I think it's a very interesting example, the variant of the example. I think. It is really terribly interesting what you said just now. Um, you're quite right that if, forget you know, whether it's due to their wanting sadomasochism or not, whatever the reason, if I were convinced that the couple would actually love to be bashed, that's why they've gone out and sitting there waiting to be bashed. Uh, <laughs> I think the power view of liberty would certainly require, suggest that you shouldn't, shouldn't proceed. I mean, not on grounds of liberty. You shouldn't proceed to save them. Of course, there may be other grounds, like welfare grounds. You might feel that they would be worse off as a result. They would be, you know, beaten and bruised and so on. So there may be other grounds, but the power view of liberty wouldn't give you a reason for interfering in this case. So it will join, as it were, the control view of liberty, in my judgment, in having nothing to recommend in this case, just stay home. On the other hand, you are taking, and that's where we begin to disagree. Up to this point, I think we are in complete agreement. You say somehow the control view of liberty would still suggest that you should go ahead and, so, and stop the bashing. Well, you couldn't give them the control that way. You see, I mean, the, you can either stop the bashing, and of course, you could think of a very peculiar scenario where you go and you stop the basher and you say, now, you have a choice. I would either release him, in which case he would proceed to go and bash you, or I will drive him away, in which case, you know, that way you might be able to recover the control thing. And that, of course, if you were to do that, the control view would say, okay, go, go and do that, give them the choice. And of course, the power view will say the same, because you might well be slightly wrong about what they want. And in this particular case, since the power view subsumes the control view and goes much further, the modification will change the power view judgment also. 
But I don't think you will get a case in this kind of situation, or, or, or any other, in which the power view is, um, makes no judgment at all, where the control view would make a judgment for interference, because the control view is on the whole more restrictive, the power view is more permissive in terms of what you should do. That, I think, is the, is the association. Now, what I think remains absolutely true is that quite often, like uh, with which you started, that it's quite often it will be the case that the power view will not recommend interference either, and that, uh, of course, is a point I fully accept. Yes, I think that is a. Um, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, if I said, if I accepted that, of course, in a sense, that would strengthen the point that I'm trying to make. That is, I was saying, in both cases, it's a violation of liberty, but they are not equal violations of liberty. And you are saying, in the particular case where I would decide anyway to stay at home take the sub-case where I have actually already decided to do that, uh, that in that sub-case of that case where I was saying that the violation of liberty exists but is less, you are saying that there may be no violation of liberty at all. So if I were to say that, that will make the contrast even more sharper, even more sharp than I was stating him to be. And so uh, that would count, as it were, an argument in the same direction, but going further than I was, when I was giving. I'd like to think more about it. Uh, my temptation is still to think that not only he is, um, he is affecting my, um, not only that he is trying to affect my liberty, which in fact uh, he's not succeeding in this case, I think I'd like to say in some possibly relatively minor way he's still affecting my liberty actually. I mean, I don't know, I don't know whether it's legitimate to bring in the possibility that even if I have decided I always have the option of changing my mind. Somehow that will have to be eliminated. So it, we have to look at a sub-sub case where not only have I decided, but it, I've decided not to change my mind either in future, as it were, and have, as it were, future contracted, not changing my mind. And I think in that case, maybe what you're saying is just right, actually, and, and, and that, of course, would make the contrast even sharper. But there is also a, a further Yes, that's the other sub-case, yes. Yes, that's right. That's the case which I was really taking. That is where I haven't decided, but I would have decided that. Uh, that's why I began by saying, as it happens, last week I did do just that, so that that's the presumption that I would have done it if I was left in that case, and I was taking a count the counterfact. You see, the, act, the way I put the example, what I did last week was the fact that I actually stayed at home, which actually happens to be true, in fact. Um, but um, the, and I put as a counterfactual a bully stopping me. Now, in this case, therefore, it was quite clear what I would have done on my own, namely what I did do, which is to stay at home. And the, the speculative bit is the counterfactual, na namely what the bully would, would want me to do. But that, since I was putting forward as assumptions, we could simply take that. So that way, I had taken a case where the decision would have been 
clearly that I would stay at home. And that, in a sense, is actually in your direction to indicate that uh, clearly if a bully had come and asked me uh, not to uh, uh, stir from the home, uh, it is possible, of course, in one respect it might change, that I might be defiant enough to say, well, if you want me to, I certainly will go out of home. Uh, there might be a kind of contrariness in me, and in a sense the situation is somewhat changed, but only to that extent. Um, but I agree, I think there would be, I think one would have to distinguish between the case when a person has actually decided and when a person hasn't decided, but would, uh, is, uh, would in fact decide, or we believe would in fact decide. Yes, I quite agree with that. Which case? In the, in the Basha case. Basha case, yes. Uh, the, there is. There is a liberty as control argument. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. And the question is whether we need to switch from control view of the to a power view of the yes. to the rationale for the That's right. Okay. I recognize that the rationale for the can be secured by a switch from the control view to the power view. Yes, you're saying it may not be necessary. What I'm asking is, uh, suppose someone says the trouble with the libertarian view is not so much that the analysis of liberty is wrong, is that the evaluation of liberty has just interpreted it. If you stick with that the view that liberty is correctly analyzed in terms of control, and you simultaneously attach tremendous importance to liberty, then you're stuck with these strongly constituted results. But if you say liberty is to be analyzed on the way they were going to control view, however, we should then all, uh, 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 we should suppose that liberty so construed is either the only value or an overriding value. There are other things that matter, and the case you describe is these other things that Yes, I think it, that's an attractive line to say that actually the, there is a case for intervening, but the case isn't based on liberty. Uh, my claim is, is stronger than that. I want to claim that there is a liberty-based argument for intervening. You see, I think, um, um, let's take a variant, you know, to differentiate, say, liberty from welfare in this case. Let's take a variant of the question that the gentleman over there raised about um, he being a psychiatrist and advising them that, look, if you get once bashed up, all doors of happiness will open up to you because you would suddenly recognize things which you don't recognize. So for God's sake, do go around and sit in this position and get bashed up, and I can assure you that you would have a terribly good time from then onwards. Um, and suppose this argument is persuasive, and these people themselves are persuaded that from the point of view of their welfare, it would be better to be bashed up. But you, you gather from them, because you know them, that despite the fact that they're convinced that it will be better for their welfare to be bashed up, they have decided that they wouldn't like to be bashed up. They would choose not to be bashed up. Now, if there is still an argument for me to intervene, it isn't a welfare-based argument, because the welfare argument runs the opposite direction. The argument seems to be simply this, that they would not choose to be bashed up. Well, that seems to me to be liberty-type argument. And on the other hand, it's not a control type argument. So I, decide, I conclude, therefore, it's a power type liberty argument. That was the reasoning. Now, of course, I think one must entertain still some doubt as to whether there may not be some third interpretation of liberty, neither power nor control, which would capture this better. I don't know of one, but there might be. But certainly, in the choice between the two, this seems to favor the power view rather than the control view. Whereas uh, 
question. Um, the argument could well be that the control view I have been discussing is the direct control view. There is such a thing as an indirect control. Now, um, I have no great quarrel with that because that may well be a legitimate interpretation of control. That's not the interpretation. Uh, my only problem is this. That first of all, that's not the interpretation of the control view that's put forward by people who argue for the control view. That's number one. Number two, if one took that view, control view, then it, subs then it becomes almost indistinguishable from what I've been calling power. More importantly, the social choice theory formulation of liberty, which is what a person would have chosen and how does it correspond to what actually occurs, that view of liberty turns out to be exactly right. Now, since Nozick and Buchanan and others criticizing the social choice theoretic definition of liberty says that's quite wrong. What you need is control. It seems to me that they are not free then to use this, what you, you and I agree may legitimately be called the indirect control view, because if they then do that, then their original criticism of the social choice formulation would disappear. Um, but I would be perfectly happy to call it in, indirect control. I don't say, uh, you know, I think that may be a perfectly good term. But that would be then roughly what I'm calling power, actually. So I think uh, we won't have any substantive disagreement. But people who put forward the control view will have, actually. 